Section 5 of The Rise and Fall of Prohibition. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scientific Methodist. The Rise and Fall of Prohibition by Charles Hanson Town. Too Much Verboten, Part 2. I remember, as a boy, an unjust teacher who kept the whole class in because one pupil whispered, and she could not discover the culprit. I never could understand her perverted sense of justice. We were guilty along with the disloyal little rascal who had violated a rule. We must suffer because he would not declare himself. But drunkards cannot conceal their wickedness. We know them. We spot them. They are obvious in any community. The town drunkard was as well known as the town pump. It has always been on our statutes that intoxication in public constituted a misdemeanor. The penalty for a misdemeanor is arrest, trial, and, if found guilty, imprisonment or payment of a fine. Few would get drunk if they knew they would be arrested. We had that law. We failed to enforce it. Hence the present inelastic laws, heaps of them, which only complicate matters and make public morals no better than they were before. No better? Worse. For drunkenness is rampant in the land, as it never has been. Prohibition does everything but prohibit. The very thing it sets out to do, it fails to do. That is as self-evident as the misery in crowded tenement districts in great cities. There is no denying it. People who never drank before drink now, in enormous numbers. Why is this? Because it is perfectly human to wish to do what one is told not to do. You know the story of the woman who, just before leaving the house, said solemnly to her children, Now, my dears, while I am gone, do not play with the matches. When she came back, the house was on fire. All the emphasis having been placed on not drinking, people are thinking of nothing but drinking. Public bars have been transferred to public coat rooms, and we have the spectacle of numerous souses before a banquet, premature roisterers who become so tight that they can hardly get through a coarse dinner. It is disgraceful, but I fear it will never stop, for impositions breed contempt for all law and order. Passive content finally breeds active rebellion. Our lawmakers should have the wit, the vision, the common sense to realize that. For a whole nation to be forced to be moral by statute and mandate is so ridiculous that it must make the gods laugh, particularly the goddess Hebe when she brings in the flowing bowl. She must almost spill the contents of her famous cup which she has been carrying these many cycles. There is always a reaction against enforced goodness, against enforced anything. But no sour-visaged sarsaparilla drinker ever realizes that. He puts over his reform and imagines that all is well. He cannot hear the shuffling of feet, the movement of armies in the dim distance. If he does, he mistakes it for applause. The fact that Americans were taking care of themselves, so far as the drink question was concerned, makes the sudden appearance of the fanatics all the more non-understandable. They came upon us with gusto. They are pathological, any doctor will tell you that. And the American people, who believe, I am told, in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, permit themselves to be governed by a pack of pathological cases who, themselves, should be in wards, if not in padded cells. And they are not content with this initial victory. As the Irishman put it, If this is prohibition, why didn't we have it long ago? And a visiting Englishman exclaimed, looking our country over, Prohibition? When does it start? They are going after our tobacco, our golf and motoring on the Sabbath, and they are going to dip into our cellars and rob us of that which we used to keep there, oh, so seldom, but now have in great and wise abundance. It never occurred to any of us in the old halcyon days when one could loll on the back platform of a horse car or trolley with the glorious multitude and smoke there to keep a supply of liquor in our homes. If we were giving a dinner and wished to oil the social wheels just a bit to start the machine going, we may have sent to the corner and bought a bottle of gin and a little vermouth and perhaps a quart of simple California claret and let it go at that. No one disgraced himself. It was all very quiet and serene and sane and nice. We hurt no one. We did ourselves no injury. Any physician will tell you that. He needs whiskey in his practice if he is the right kind of physician. And a pleasant time was had by all, as the country newspapers say. But from that undramatic drinking what, because of Mr. Longface, have we leapt to? To the hip flask, the sly treating in coat rooms, and other places I need hardly mention. 
long before dinner begins so that one may be sure of a sensation which no decent man should care to experience a nervous tension is in the air putting us all back twenty years i assure the reader that never once in my life did i carry a flask of brandy even when i was going on a long and dusty and tedious journey yet my dear mother was as certain that i should take one as that i should wear rubbers when it rained and i let her believe i did both for the sake of her peace of mind was my mother a criminal for her quiet advice not then but she would be considered so now with mr volstead's act on the records of my beloved land actually i am a criminal if i take a sip outside my home in my club in my travels if i transport a little of that whimsical stuff of which poets have sung so beautifully and often i can be dragged to jail if i am caught pooh what a mockery of personal freedom it all is i heard a fine citizen say not long ago a man of wealth and position a publicist a man of affairs i am using the word in its proper sense a man who loved very definitely the great america that used to be that for the first time in his life he had the despicable thought that he would like to withhold something if he could on his income tax he felt little compunction for the base thought why should he hand his hard-earned money over to a government which deprived him of so much of his personal liberty and held over his head the dire threat of further deprivations what was this man getting out of america he asked me just a dull time to be truthful he was but one more waffle from the great national waffle iron when he wanted diversion he must pack up and fare to other lands where living is still living crave a passport swear that he had paid last year's tax produce a receipt he had never received and promise to pay this year's and either not stay away too long or see to it that his lawyer attended to it for him everyone is ticketed docketed labeled put in a card index this tabulation of citizens how we smiled at it when the prussians carried it to the extremes they did poor creatures we said of them to stand for such errant nonsense a jolly state of affairs it makes one feel so loving toward one's government doesn't it we are all children and uncle sam is no longer a symbolical old figure but an avuncular autocrat who goes about nosing everywhere almost invading the sanctity of our homes ah he may do it yet in his senseless quest for this and that but just as santa claus could never get down every chimney in the world one feels certain that uncle sam cannot pry into every wine cellar and examine if he had all eternity every tiny bank balance moreover my friend will not cheat on his income tax he at least is decent let us not delude ourselves that we are living in a democracy any longer laws were passed from time to time in the history of our great country without the people's vote but there were laws that served our best interests and did not interfere with our personal liberty when our rights as citizens were molested we got up on our hind legs and yelled what is this we naturally inquired why it is what has always been done came the answer from the bar of injustice and that was literally true only we didn't know it you can't break the constitution was a further argument once a federal amendment always a federal amendment you know and why pray if the good old iron constitution cannot be tampered with it is high time that it was if our forefathers who framed it meant it to be an utterly inelastic document they didn't count on the elastic minds of the american people new occasions teach new duties time makes ancient good uncouth said the wise james russell lowell once and nothing is more certain than the fact that the moment has come when the people should be heard and not a handful of legislators who rushed madly to lay in a stock of wine and spirits when they saw which way the wind was blowing their straws it grieved me as a good american to hear an englishman say the other evening before a lot of my fellow countrymen that his idea of a complete life would be to spend nine months of the year in england as a british citizen and three months in the united states as an american subject there was much mirth but somehow i could not laugh and i hope these constitutional amendments coming so thick and fast are not causing me to lose my sense of humor it was a statement in which so much of truth was compressed that i shuddered and i thought of all the forms of verboten that have lately been foisted upon us i recalled how ten years ago a friend of mine had returned from germany and told me laughingly how the poor subjects of the kaiser were eternally forbidden to do this and that it was verboten 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 everywhere the eye turned in the parks in restaurants in the galleries in the theatres everywhere always some petty restriction some tyrannical interference with the masses and he said then how contrary to the broad american spirit was this constant stress on thou shalt not 
We both smiled over it and pitied the much-ruled and controlled Germans. What a glorious land we live in, we said in unison, lifting our glasses, and how proud we are of our freedom. But could we honestly say that now? Do not let us be hypocrites. Before foreigners, we bravely and loyally uphold our form of government, because one does not like to cleanse his soiled linen in public or reveal a family quarrel. But deep down in our hearts, I hear it discussed everywhere I go, is a feeling of apprehension, and the everlasting question is being asked, whither are we as a people being led? If the political machinery is being clogged with too many foolish and unnecessary laws that are merely jokers and venomous restrictions, why do we not speak out in meeting, call together groups of citizens as we are privileged to do under the Constitution, unless another amendment has been added since this was written, and protest against this extravagant misuse of power? The reason England has always been such a comfortable country to live in is because of the spirit of constructive criticism that has filtered through the nation. If a Londoner does not like the service on the tram roads, he writes to the Times about it, and the matter is adjusted. He has the backing of all his neighbors, and ten to one they have written too. But how many Americans, insulted in the subway or by some public servant, will sit down and write a letter of complaint? We stand meekly like droves of cattle behind tapes in motion picture palaces, pressed by eager little ushers endowed with a momentary authority, until released and permitted to fumble our way down dark aisles to such seats as we can find. We allow grand head waiters to hold us in check when we enter a smart restaurant, not indeed behind tape, but behind a silken cord, which does not mitigate the insult, however, and we humbly beg them to see if they can get us a table, and some of us slip them a greenback to gain their august favor. We allow ticket speculators to buy up all the best places in our theaters, adding what profit they demand, and say nothing, though there is a statute forbidding such extortion. Ah, we're here for a good time, and we don't care what it costs us, is the answer of the average visitor to the metropolis when he is asked why he does not protest against such unjust measures. I have known only one rich man to refuse rooms at a fine hotel simply because he felt it wrong to pay $17 a day, no matter what his bank balance. It is people like that who help the rest of us to a return to normal conditions. He thinks of someone but himself. Yet we talk of prohibition as though we were manfully trying to save the next generation from the perils of drink. We are doing nothing of the sort. We are merely bowing our craven heads to a mandate because we have neither the courage nor the energy to speak loudly against a stupid law foisted upon us by an organized minority. Our altruistic purpose is not apparent, for it never existed. Ah, but, someone whispers, the majority want this and that, so we must give in to them. Even so, why should we give in to them? The majority of people prefer flashy, meaningless movies, and Pollyanna and Harold Bell Wright, and chewing gum, and cheap jewelry, and gopher prairie, and slapstick humor, and loud laughter, and a crowded beach on Sunday, and hideous neckties and shirts and summer furs, and a hundred and one other things entirely foreign to my desires. Why, then, should I walk in their path, jump over the hurdles that the multitude puts in front of me? Arnold Bennett once said that the classics were kept alive, not by the man in the street, but by the passionate few. He was dead right. In the words of your beloved majority, he said a mouthful. Now because my neighbor and my neighbor's neighbor have a weakness for the best sellers, not the best sellers, and find a robust pleasure in never thinking of anything beyond baseball, I do not see why I should be forced to indulge in a stupid Pollyanna optimism and forget and neglect my Keats and Shakespeare. End of section 5. Recording by Scientific Methodist.